The destructive power of an atomic bomb is something that's almost difficult to even comprehend. An explosion that can destroy an entire city? What? Absolutely terrifying. And when the very first atomic bomb detonated over New Mexico during the Trinity test in 1945, the world was forever changed. The modern era had begun. But even the Trinity test, which was insane in itself, even that test was small compared to what future atomic explosions would be. By the 60s, we had bombs that were a thousand times larger. I mean, it's truly insane. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the evolution and timeline of atomic weapons. What was the first underwater test? The first underground test? What about the first test in space? We also have a record holding blast yield chart. We're going to cover all the milestones talk about all the big events in today's video on the evolution and history of the atomic bomb. We are starting our timeline back in 1945 with the first atomic test, the Trinity test. This test occurred on July 16, 1945 at 5.29 a.m. local time at what was then the White Sands Proving Ground, just 40 miles southeast of Socorro, New Mexico. This was an atmospheric test with a blast yield of about 25 kilotons of TNT. The height of the mushroom cloud reached over 38,000 feet. The Trinity test was a culmination of the top secret Manhattan Project. The device itself looked like a metal sphere with wires attached to it and it was referred to as the gadget. This was also the first bomb to utilize the implosion plutonium design. Now obviously the Trinity test was the largest atomic bomb ever detonated so it is indeed our first record holder. Less than a month Month later, on August 6, the first use of an atomic bomb during wartime occurred over Hiroshima, Japan. The atomic bomb named Little Boy exploded with a yield of about 16 kilotons, all in all taking the lives of somewhere between 80 and 140,000 individuals. The Little Boy atomic bomb design was the first gun-type fission weapon, and the first atomic bomb to only utilize uranium-235. Only a few days later on August 9th, the city of Nagasaki would also be struck with an atomic bomb, taking the lives of 40 to 80 thousand people. It is the last atomic bomb to ever be used during wartime. The bomb used over Nagasaki utilized the Mark III or Fat Man design, which was an implosion plutonium device based off of the first atomic bomb during the Trinity test. The Mark III Fat Man design was the first bulk produced atomic bomb with 120 built. On September 2nd, 1945, World War II would come to an end, and surprisingly, the next nuclear bomb test wouldn't occur until almost a year later in the summer of 1946 with Operation Crossroads. The actual first post-war atomic bomb detonation was Crossroads A which was also nicknamed Gilda. This occurred on June 30th, 1946, and utilized the Fat Man Mark III atomic weapon design. The blast yield was about 23 kilotons, and it was detonated about 600 feet above the water, 3.5 miles away from Bikini Atoll. Bikini Atoll is part of the Pacific Proving Grounds, one of several test sites that we will be discussing today. The second test of the Crossroads series was Baker, also about 23 kilotons. The Baker test was the first underwater atomic bomb, and the footage of the blast has become absolutely iconic. Many famous atomic bomb photos are of the Baker test. The bomb itself was about 90 feet underwater attached to the USS LSM-60. The USS LSM-60 is this boat right here. No piece from the LSM-60 was ever recovered. Since this test was done underwater, the blinding light that you usually see from an atomic weapon cannot be seen. After Operation Crossroads came Operation Sandstone in 1948. This test was the first to occur at Enowitak Atoll and also featured a new high yield record with sandstone yoke, which produced a yield of 49 kilotons on April 30th, 1946. So we have a new bomb to put on the list. Operation Sandstone was the first to be carried out by the Atomic Energy Commission and their purpose was to test out a new bomb design. This would all lead to the development of the Mark IV nuclear bomb, the first mass-produced bomb with 550 made. 1945 to 1948 was kind of the golden age for the United States and their atomic testing. No other country had atomic bombs, they really had nothing to worry about, they were just trying different things, blowing up ships because they were the sole nuclear power. 
But all of that would change in 1949. In 1949, the Soviet Union became the second country to successfully create an atomic explosion, and they would do so with RDS-1. RDS-1, aka First Lightning, or as the Americans referred to it, Joe 1, exploded on August 29, 1949 with a yield of 21 kilotons. This test was conducted at a remote test site in Kazakh SSR. The bomb design was very similar, one might say identical, to the Fat Man design, thanks to some Soviet espionage. The event would mark the beginning of the Cold War, a war that would last all the way up into the 90s. Many families in both the Soviet Union and the United States during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s thought that maybe, you know, tomorrow won't come and they'll just be obliterated in the middle of the night. It's pretty scary. 1950, though, was a nice relaxing year as there were no atomic tests in 1950. However, 1951 would mark the first atomic test to occur over the continual United States since Trinity. Operation Ranger was a series of five bombs, and they were the first to be tested at the Nevada test site, specifically Area 5. The smallest test was ABLE, with only a 1 kiloton yield. The largest was 22 kilotons. Going back out to NOE Talk Atoll, at the Pacific Proving Grounds, we have another new major atomic milestone. The first atomic bomb with a yield of over 100 kilotons. In fact, make that over 200 kilotons. The test series Greenhouse had a specific test known as George that had an estimated yield of 225 kilotons. That's already way larger than the Trinity test, and we're not even close to how big it gets. This test was conducted on May 8, 1951, and was meant to test out a theoretical thermonuclear design, something we'll get to soon definitely a new record holder. So obviously we have two different test sites. We have the Nevada test site, NTS, and we had the Pacific Proving Grounds, which is part of the Marshall Islands. And you'll notice that the large, huge atomic bombs were all tested out at the Pacific Proving Grounds and all the smaller, you know, 20 kiloton tests occurred at the Nevada test site. One would assume that would be uh, for safety reasons. They didn't want massive 220 kiloton explosions over the continual United States in case there's some drift of whatever. So yeah, why not the middle of the Pacific? Towards the end of 1951, a new test series at the Nevada test site known as Operation Buster Jangle would be the first to feature armed soldiers. Perhaps you have seen the iconic footage of soldiers in trenches jumping out and walking towards a mushroom cloud. Definitely creepy vibes from this clip. Also during Operation Buster Jangle, the test uncle was the first that was partially underground. So we had the USSR and the USA as the sole nuclear powers all the way through 1951. However, we have a new country entering the Atomic Superpowers Club in 1952 with the United Kingdom and Operation Hurricane. Operation Hurricane was conducted at Montebello Islands in Western Australia on October 2nd and had a yield of 25 kilotons. There were now three nuclear powers, but only a month later, the US would be entering the second generation, a new tier of nuclear weapons, the first thermonuclear device. So what the heck is that? Well, a thermonuclear bomb, also referred to as a hydrogen bomb or H-bomb, utilizes the power of fusion rather than fission. Just know that like this is a whole new level of bomb. We don't talk about kilotons when we talk about thermonuclear bombs. We talk about megatons. One megaton is a thousand kilotons. The first successful thermonuclear test came on November 1st, 1952 with Operation Ivy Test Mike. Ivy Mike was detonated over Enoe Takatoll and had an estimated blast yield of 10 megatons. 10 megatons. 10,000 times larger than that one kiloton explosion we talked about earlier. Yeah, definitely our new record holder. But pure fission bombs weren't done yet. In fact, the largest US fission bomb ever detonated occurred a couple weeks later on November 16th with Ivy King. This Gen 1 pure fission bomb had a yield of 500 kilotons. The Soviets were quick to join the second generation of thermonuclear weapons, as less than a year later, on August 12th, 1953, they conducted RDS-6, also known as Joe 4 here in the US. However, the blast yield wasn't very impressive for a second generation atomic bomb, as it only had a blast yield of 400 kilotons, still easily enough to destroy a city. Going back out to the Nevada test site, we have the first tactical nuclear warhead shot from a cannon, aka our first atomic artillery device. 
This was a 280 millimeter artillery fired atomic projectile. This was part of Operation Upshot Not Hole, and the shot itself was Grabble, which occurred on May 25th, 1953. Similar to Operation Buster Jangle, Upshot Not Hole involved over 21,000 soldiers. This test again came with some pretty iconic footage. Textbook mushroom cloud right here. A year later, on March 1st, 1954, we have a new high-yield blast record with Operation Castle Test Bravo. Castle Bravo had an estimated blast yield of 15 megatons. Absolutely insane. And it was actually quite surprising to have such a high blast yield because they only expected somewhere between 7 and 8 megatons. Unfortunately, due to this high blast yield and an unpredictable weather pattern, the fallout from Castle Bravo actually spread over the Marshall Islands and caused over 90 injuries, and unfortunately would take the life of a radio man on a Japanese ship known as Fifth Lucky Dragon. The controversies behind this test, as well as other tests over the Pacific Proving Grounds, was actually the inspiration behind Godzilla. Speaking of of Godzilla and pop culture, perhaps you are familiar with the Call of Duty map Nuketown. Well that's inspired by the next operation on our timeline, Operation Teapot. Operation Teapot had a shot named Apple II that occurred on May 5th, 1955. Apple II was intended to test various building construction types in an atomic blast. All the tests from Apple II were actually made into a documentary made by the Federal Civil Defense Administration called Operation Q, and it was released to the public you know, to give them an idea of what it would be like. Definitely an iconic test. The next test actually occurred 500 miles off the coast of San Diego, California with Operation Wigwam. This was the first deep water test, and it was meant to research how vulnerable submarines are to underwater nuclear blasts. The blast itself was about 30 kilotons at a depth of 2,000 feet. So we talked about the first Soviet thermonuclear bomb, RDS-6, earlier. Well, now we come to the first true Soviet thermonuclear bomb, the Soviets' first bomb in the megatons. RDS-37 had 1.6 megatons and was tested on November 22nd, 1955. It was highly inspired by the US's Castle Bravo test. Unfortunately, two people were killed in this atomic test. A soldier in a trench below and a little girl who was in a building over 40 miles away. Check out this footage from a town 45 miles away. This is one of my favorite pieces of atomic footage because it kind of gives you like a real world example of what it would be like to be in a situation like this. It just looks so eerie off in the distance. And then several minutes later, the blast wave finally catches up to you. We are now moving forward to 1957, back in the United States with the controversial Operation Plub, Plumb Blob. Plumb Bob, can't quite say that. Operation Plumb PB is notable for having the largest nuclear weapon ever tested over the continual US with the shot Hood. This was at 74 kilotons and occurred on July 5th, 1957. Also with Operation PB, we have the first fully underground test with the shot Rainier, which was on September 19th. The bomb was only 1.7 kilotons, but it was still enough to be detected by seismologists all around the world. We have a third country joining the thermonuclear club with the United Kingdom on November 8, 1957. The test Grapple X was conducted over Christmas Island. The blast yield was 1.8 megatons, which I guess is spelled differently in uh, UK English. However, their largest yield ever was from Grapple Y, which occurred on April 28, 1958, and had an estimated yield of 3 megatons. After this test, the Brits and the Americans actually joined forces with the 1958 US-UK Mutual Defense Agreement. This allowed the British to test their atomic weapons at the Nevada test site, which they did 24 times. It's time to go up to the very first high atmospheric test, which came with Operation Hardtack 1 Shot Teak at 76.8 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And this was with a massive 3.8 megaton atomic bomb. Technically, this is upper atmosphere. It's not a true space atomic test, but that would come with Operation Argus and Argus 1, conducted at 200 kilometers above the Earth's surface, but this only had a yield of 1.7 kilotons. Towards the end of 1958, we entered a limited test ban treaty between the USSR and the USA. This occurred between 1958 and 1961. Do you know who didn't participate in the limited test ban treaty? Well, that would be France, who tested their first atomic bomb on February 13th, 1960 with Operation Gerboi Bleu. This was done over in French Algeria and had a yield of 70 kilotons. 
So of course we did have that limited test ban treaty that we were talking about earlier. That was about to end and the Soviet Union really wanted to flex on just the world and they would do so on October 30th, 1961 with the massive Tsar Bomba, which had an estimated magnitude of 52 to 60 megatons. Truly insane. In fact, the bomb itself was rated for 100 megatons. This is the largest atomic bomb ever detonated. So it is the final member on our list. Here's what it looks like compared to the Trinity test. I mean, absolutely mind boggling. This was done way up here on this long island above the Soviet Union. Following the massive Tsar Bomba, the US conducted the very first all underground test with Operation Nougat, which occurred between 1961 and 1962. This test would be a precursor to what would become the norm in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. The first atomic handheld rocket launcher would also come in 1962, this little handheld rocket launcher was called the Davy Crockett. Also with Operation Sunbeam came the smallest nuclear bomb ever with Little Feller 1, which occurred on July 17th, 1962. This was also the last atomic bomb atmospheric test over the continual US. Back out in the ocean, we go to the first ICBM test, and that was Frigate Bird of Operation Dominic on May 6, 1962. This was the first and only ICBM test with an active warhead. A pretty massive warhead too, as it had a yield of 700 kilotons. Finally, we come to Operation Fishbowl, which had the largest atomic bomb ever detonated in outer space. The test Starship Prime had 1.4 megatons and it exploded over 400 kilometers above the Earth's surface. Also with Operation Fishbowl came the final US atmospheric atomic test. This was a test tightrope and it was conducted on November 4th, 1962. In 1963, everything with atomic testing would change with the Partial Test Ban Treaty. This prohibited any signing nation from testing atomic bombs except for those conducted underground. There was one notable nation that did not sign this treaty, and that is of course China, who conducted their first test on October 16th, 1964. Their first test was titled 596. And three years later, they would conduct their first thermonuclear test with test number six that occurred on June 17th, 1967. Following the limited test ban treaty, the US conducted Operation Storax, which actually looked into finding non-war uses for atomic bombs. So perhaps, you know, could you use an atomic bomb for mining or for creating a large hole in the ground, which is exactly what they did with the test Sedan. Sedan is by far the largest crater at the Nevada test site. The Russians did something very similar and created a large crater themselves. However, theirs actually filled up with water and turned into a lake known as Lake Changan. So the 60s and 70s and 80s were kind of a lot of nothing, just a lot of underground tests. There were a few notable tests that we should discuss though. On November 6, 1971, Operation Gromit test Kanakin was the largest underground nuclear explosion ever at five megatons. Another event worth mentioning was the very last atmospheric test ever, at least to this day in 2023, and that was from China on October 16th, 1980. Another notable operation was the first joint Soviet-US test with Operation Touchstone in 1988. And finally, the last US test was Shot Divider of Operation Julin on September 23rd, 1992. After this test, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty would go in effect, and this would ban all atomic tests from all the signing nations. Here's a list of every nation who has tested an atomic weapon, including both a fission bomb, a fusion bomb, and the last time they tested one. It's possible that China may have conducted an atomic test in 2020, although it has not been confirmed, and that's a little sketch. So yeah, atomic bombs, they're scary. Thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next video.